<clears throat> All right. <clears throat> I believe we're going to be picking up here in verse 9. Uh, but does anybody remember anything about verses 1 to 8? Uh, anything about what's taking place there? not anything too earth shattering going on in verses 1 to 8 but right John John is just building up Jesus he he really is trying to uh, I guess it's kind of like whenever you have someone coming I don't think buttering up is the right phrase but he's building up Jesus so that people have the appropriate appreciation for him that they ought to have for him. Jesus is the Savior. He is uh, He is the faithful witness. Verse 5. He is the firstborn of the dead. That means he is risen from the dead. And he continues to live on. You see that verse 18. Uh, he is the faithful witness. He's going to speak for his sheep. He's going to defend his sheep. If his sheep have acknowledged him. Uh, Matthew 10. Or Matthew. Yeah, Matthew 10. Verse 32 and 33, he will uh, acknowledge them before the Father and his angels. Consequently, if they deny him, he's going to deny them before the Father and his angels. Um, he's the one who has loved us. Remember John said in 1 John chapter 4 that we love because he first loved us. And it says that he has freed us uh, from our sins by his blood. His blood, um, 1 John 4 and verse 10 uh, is our propitiation, that wrath-appeasing sacrifice for our sins. Um, he, that, that is Christ, made us into a kingdom. Colossians 1 and verse 13. He has transferred us from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of his marvelous light. Um, Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verses 22 and 23. He has set himself over us as, as head or rather he was placed over us as head by the father chapter 2 we are being continually joined together verses 17 through 19 into one glorious nation one glorious temple uh, meant for his honor so we're a kingdom we're priests of his first peter 2 and verse 9 um, and and it's to him that belongs all glory dominion and honor you see that ephesians 3 and verse 21 as well as we're going to see it later in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 5 and verse 12, in the, uh, in the worship of Jesus that you see at the throne. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 12 says, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And then you'll see it reiterated there in verse 13, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. So he's building up who Jesus is. And now in verse 9, John is going to give an account of the things which he sees. You see verse 9 through 11, you have the command, the command to write. He's instructed, verse 9, he says, I, John, your brother, and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So John is, this is, the uh, book of Revelation is John's first writing, right, that we have where he actually mentions himself by name. And he is mentioning that he is the one giving this revelation, and he is mentioning the fact that they are brethren, those to whom he's writing to. Um, for some, that would kind of be a, a meaningful touch there. I mean, you think about Smyrna. Smyrna, uh, Jesus says in verse 9, uh, Revelation 2 and verse 9, I know your tribulation, your poverty, and the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Uh, you know, they're going through a great tribulation. John goes back, verse 9, John says, I know your tribulation, I'm enduring it with you as your brother, as your partner in the gospel. And he, he's suffering for the same reason that they're suffering. They're suffering, the church in Smyrna, because of their, their faith. And now John is suffering because of his faith. Uh, was John someone that when pressured would back off of preaching the gospel? Think about Acts chapter 4 or Acts chapter 5. 
Yeah, he's one of the sons of thunder. He, he is a zealous, zealous man. Acts 4 and Acts 5, him and Peter are thrown in prison. They're beaten on account of preaching Jesus. And uh, remember, him and Peter were responsible for that uh, phrase, you choose whom we should listen to, you or God. Um, verse 10, John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord today, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Uh, just a little thing about verse 10. Uh, I was in the spirit on the Lord today. What would you assume that this means? Yeah, in trance. But, uh, um, so yeah, he was in trance on the Lord's day. The Lord's day would refer to what day of the week? The first day of the week. That would, that would be Sunday. Um, so you just look at it contextually. I was in, uh, I was in the spirit. I was entranced, uh, kind of like Peter was in Acts chapter 9, uh, whenever he had the vision from the Lord regarding the Gentiles being pure. Uh, he was entranced on the first day of the week. The first day of the week is significant, of course, for many reasons. Uh, the first day of the week is when the church was established in Pentecost, the uh, first day of the week. Uh, was um, when the church worshipped, uh, Acts 20 and verse 27, 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2. And the first day of the week is when the Lord rose from the dead, Matthew 28, verse 1, Mark 16 and verse 1, uh, Luke 24 and verse 1, and John 20 and verse 11. So it bears significance in many ways. Um, how it bears significance that he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, in the book of Revelation, I'm not entirely sure, uh, but it's just kind of, I guess, like a little neat point. I think that's all that some of the stuff in the book of Revelation boils down to is just a, a neat thing to consider or a neat thing to see. Um, look here at verse 11. This is the instruction that was given to John. The instruction is, write what you see in a book and send it. So he's to write what he sees. This means that John is receiving a vision. A vision means that what he is seeing is not real. It's not, he's not able to physically grasp it. And a lot of people treat the book of Revelation as if it's something that John physically grasped that. So he's to write what he sees and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and Smyrna and to Pergamum and Thyatira and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Now these churches are literal, and we know this because they're being named by their geographic location, and they were already identified geographically uh, in verse 4, the seven churches that are in Asia. And so these are seven literal churches that are receiving a letter, and you know, you kind of fast forward a little bit to chapters 2 and 3, whenever they receive this letter, the uh, Kind of the scary thought here is these letters are part of John's revelation, right? It's not like, let's say, the church in Ephesus received Revelation chapter 1, Revelation chapters 4 through 22, and then received their letter. They received Smyrna's letter. They received Pergamum's letter. They received Thyatira's letter, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. And that goes for each and every one of them. And you can look at the very message that each one received. Ephesus, you're doing all this right, but you left your first love. Smyrna, you're doing everything you need to be doing. Uh, Pergamum, you're promiscuous. Thyatira, you've been tolerant of sin. Sardis, you're sleeping, you're dead whenever people think you're alive. Philadelphia, again, you're doing everything you need to be doing. Laodicea, I, I want to spew you out of my mouth. Uh, each of these churches was reading about or reading these things about the other church. And so maybe um, a good um, point of practice is to think about which of these churches would represent the congregation here and how would we like it if people thought about, let's say, Riverside as they did Ephesus. Okay, so Riverside, they're working, they, they bear with those, or they cannot bear false teaching, they stand against false teaching, but they lost their first love. I don't think we would be 
wanting to uh, have that kind of association, right? We want to be like Smyrna, hitting it right. Philadelphia, hitting it right. Just a thought there from verses 10 to 11. So he wrote uh, just one letter to, to all these churches and they read everything? Mm-hmm. And not the individual? Yep. Letter. Yep. Um, all, all of this is together. And so whenever he sends, so he's sending uh, what he says in the book to the church in Ephesus. Ephesus is receiving all 22 chapters. Here it is. And so Ephesus is seeing Smyrna's letter. Ephesus is seeing Pergamum's letter. All of that. They're, they're seeing the information written about the others. It's not. It's right. the same. Yeah, but I mean, I didn't notice the whole book of Revelation. I thought it just he wrote down here for them what they were doing. They could improve or just better. Um, I mean, the way we're reading it from chapter one going through chapter 22 is the way they were reading it. And so, oh, okay. yeah, so Ephesus would go in yeah, the same I, transitions I was, there. I thought it was like one went to Ephesus and he wrote the other one. Did he make copies? Did they, did they copy and send oh, to the okay. individual areas or did they send one letter and it have to be carried around? Well, I would assume that he made copies just because the command is to uh, yeah. write what you see in a book and send yeah. it to the seven right. churches. Right. So each of the seven churches. But they would get a full copy. Yeah, 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 they would get a full copy. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of copying, man. That's a lot of writing. Uh, I can't write that much. Um, all right, let's see here. Verses 12 through 16, uh, you have more about Jesus. Uh, I kind of titled this the commander. He's giving the command. Uh, verses 12 to 13, you have Jesus in the midst of the churches. He says, uh, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. So verses 13 and 14, you have Jesus standing in the midst of the churches. The churches are referred to as the lampstands. Any reason why you would think that the churches are called lampstands? Supposed to be a light to the world, uh, Philippians 2, uh, I believe, verse 14. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, Ryan, you are the light of the world. The city set upon a hill cannot be hidden, and we're, to build, uh, we're supposed to be doing good works for what purpose? To be drawing men to the Father. Not supposed to be putting, uh, you know, I'm talking about... Um, that song about the devil not going to put a bushel over a light for what reason because our purpose is to draw men to God so, uh, as a light does he says here I see one like a son of man a son of man uh, this is an Old Testament reference you know what book it might be referring back to the son of man Daniel chapter 7 verses 9 and 10 Daniel chapter 7 verses 9 and 10 we'll, let's look there right quick <clears throat> Daniel chapter 7 uh, Daniel is having a dream and he's having these visions uh, he sees four different beasts uh, these beasts um display four different kingdoms sometimes uh, it, it's stated that way and um, kind of the same message you know in chapter 2 uh, Daniel had seen the, uh, the vision of, of the man that is composed of four different materials the four different kingdoms there and the stone coming and the stone breaks it all but the, the stone does not uh, come apart because it's a, a kingdom that's set up forever um, well, here, verse 9, Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, you're being introduced to the king of that kingdom that exists forever. It says, As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and his hair 
of his head was like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were open. Uh, here you have the Ancient of Days, the Son of Man. Uh, yeah, verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there was one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is, ever, is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. That same kind of thing is reiterated concerning the church in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28. It's a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Um, we continue on here with the, uh, in the book of Revelation, Revelation 1 verse 13. Uh, you have the Son of Man there. That phrase, Son of Man, is uh, Jesus' favorite term in speaking of himself. Uh, trying to constantly point people back to the understanding that he is the Messiah, that he is the one who is going to redeem man. You see it in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28 in terms of him offering himself as a son of man in order to redeem those who are lost and in sin. Uh, verses 14 through 16, you have more descriptions of Jesus uh, that we find. Uh, pointing back to Daniel chapter 7 verse 14 the hairs of his head were white like white wool like snow his eyes like a flame of fire his feet were like burnished bronze refined in the furnace some people think that refers to uh, whenever uh, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were thrown in the fiery furnace and there appeared the kind of the figure of a fourth individual there some people think that's a reference there in Daniel chapter 3 and his voice was like the roar of many waters. So it's a powerful voice. And so really what John is trying to describe here concerning Jesus, what Daniel described here concerning Jesus long before, is that Jesus is, is, is a powerful, powerful individual. The sheer presence of him is powerful. His voice is powerful. And here in verse 16, uh, what he yields is powerful. It says in his right hand he held seven stars. Seven stars, you look down in Revelation 1 verse 20, refers to seven churches. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Um, the sharp two-edged sword is a symbol of authority, authority over nations, authority over all men. Sharp two-edged sword, ring a bell of any scripture. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, talking about the word of God. How does Jesus have authority over all nations? Think about this. That sharp two-edged sword, the word. John 12 and verse 48, his word judges. He has authority over all nations. So you see Jesus, he's powerful in his presence, powerful in his voice. He is powerful in what he yields. He yields the church. He yields authority. And his face, it says, was like a sun shining in full strength. It's, it's hard to look upon his glory. Uh, you remember when Moses was face to face with God, God made him wear a veil because his presence would kill him. Um, the Christian now gets to look at Jesus, and this is a hard thing to comprehend, gets to look at God, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, unveiled and face to face. Um, we get to see him in all of his glory, and that's because all of his glory is manifested in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the glory of the Father. Uh, you see that in John chapter 1 and verse 14. So you continue here. Let's look here at verses uh, 17 through 20. You have the command continued. Here, here Jesus is speaking more. He says, Then I saw him. Notice John's reaction. Then I saw him. I fell at his feet as though dead. That's a, that's a symbol of yielding uh, a 
authority over to him, submitting yourself. It's kind of like, and this isn't the best example, but whenever you walk in the house, your dog might come before you and then lay on its back, right, and show its belly to you. It's saying, you're my master. John is bowing down. He fell at his feet as though dead at the sheer appearance of Jesus, the one whom he walked with for three and a half years, because now, I mean, John knew how glorious Jesus was then, right? John knew that Jesus was going to be a king, that he was going to sit upon a throne. That's why, um, and that's why he followed him. He knew he was the Messiah, but now, later on in life, John has a much greater understanding, and so now he's standing before the Lord once again, one of his closest friends, while Jesus was in the flesh, and he falls down at his feet as though dead. He is taken away by the sheer power and glory of Christ. Uh, but he laid his right hand on me. This is typical fashion of Jesus, right? Think about all the times that the apostles were utterly afraid. He laid his hand upon me saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. What is it? Words of comfort. Words of comfort. John knows he is in the presence of the one who yields authority over all men. John knows he is in the presence of the greatest and he's afraid. It's, it's, it's fear instilling to look upon God and his first instinct. Let me encourage you. I am the, I fear not, I'm the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades that... Uh, we see the, the Hebrew writer using the same argumentation in Hebrews chapter 2 in verses, I believe, 9 through 14, talking about how Jesus became like men. He took on flesh, and he took on flesh in order to give his life so that he could be the overcomer of death and so that he could wield everything uh, that, that would be a weakness to men. The man's greatest enemy is death. And so if Christ conquers death, he becomes man's greatest ally. And so Jesus is man's greatest ally. He says, I died and behold him alive forevermore. He's everlasting. He's ever living. We've seen that description given of him twice already in chapter 1. And I have the keys of death and Hades. That means death and Hades yields to him. And we saw that whenever we looked in Revelation 20 this past Sunday. Uh, you had the judgment scene there. The books were open. And who yielded up their dead? The sea yielded up their dead. Some people think that's in reference to the creation, those who are still living, uh, those who are still on the earth. And then you have death and Hades yielding up. That, that's those who have passed. Death and Hades didn't put up a fight, right? They did exactly what he said. Why? Because Jesus conquered death. He put death in submission. Um, he says, write these things that you have seen, those that are, and those that are to take place after this. So, there's some things that have happened, there's some things that are going to happen, there's some things uh, that, that won't happen for a while. Um, some say the, the things that uh, you have seen for chapter 1, talking about his appearance, the things that are going to happen, chapters 2 and 3, and the things that are to take place after this, chapters 4 through 22. Um, it says, as for the mystery of the seven stars, Jesus is explaining, it's like the parables. At the end of the parables, if they came to Jesus and said, we don't understand, he said, let me explain it for you. The four soils are this. The seed is this. So here he is. He's explaining it for us. As for the mystery of the, of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So that's where that leaves off. Chapter 2, he rolls right into his letters. Here Jesus is. He's speaking directly to the angel. Uh, chapter 2, uh, looking here at verses 1 through 8, you have Jesus' letter to the church in Ephesus. Yeah. Idea of being an angel being assigned to each church. 
I was going to get into that right here in verse 1. There it is. Uh, chapter 2 and verse 1. You have the words of Jesus, the words of him. It says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Um, I was going to say, uh, first, uh, with Ephesus, Ephesus is a coastal city. Um, I'd hate to break it to you, but it, it was considered better than Corpus in the ancient day. Uh, it, it was much more kind of like uh, Los Angeles. Uh, you look at the largest port in the United States, it's the port there in Los Angeles. Ephesus was the largest port in the Roman Empire. And so because of that, it was classified, and I saw this several places, classified as the fourth most important city in Rome. And so um, hats off to Ephesus for being very important. It's located in modern, uh, I'm going to try this, uh, Selkuk. Turkey, modern Turkey. So if you see the country Turkey, look at the the uh, look at the west side, and you'll see a kind of a, a channel running through. There it is, boom, right there. Um, there is still present uh, ruins of the Temple of Diana or the Temple of Artemis. Artemis, Greek, Diana, uh, Roman, uh, which was one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. And so spectators from all across the world will come and look at this. And I saw one man, uh, one historian, um, I'm talking like dropping back to 300, 280, something like that, who said in regards to the Temple of Diana that it was far greater than the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. And he said just essentially it was the most beautiful thing he'd ever looked at. And if you are to look at what they kind of constructed to look like, um, what they figure it would look like, I mean, it's, it's a breathtaking structure. It's massive. Uh, they say that it was, the platform of it was 418 feet by 239 feet. Um, if you're like me, those numbers make absolutely no sense. So I'm going to get to the comparison here in a second. Uh, the temple that sat upon the platform was 342 feet by 163 feet and had over 100 supporting columns. What that comes down to is roughly twice the size of the Lincoln Monument. That's pretty big, man. That's pretty big. And a little over half the size of the Michigan Stadium. The Michigan Stadium is the largest stadium in the United States. It's a massive massive structure and uh, it was absolutely uh, breathtaking to look at but that structure was the house of idolatry there in Ephesus and so as you talk about idolatry its presence in Ephesus uh, idolatry certainly had a big part in that city and that city served as a symbol of the great idolatry that engrossed the whole empire uh, and so the Christians there, uh, you, you think about the descriptions in chapters, uh, in verses 2 and 3 and in verse uh, 6 on how they would relentlessly stand against false teaching, false ideas, and things of that nature. That had to be huge. I mean, that had to take some goal to really stand against all the idolatry and all the false teaching that would intermingle and try to include the idolatry because uh, you're, you're there in the capital of it. You're there right in the midst of it. That's like going, that's like starting a church in Las, uh, Las Vegas and making it your mission to speak against gambling. You're there in a gambler's paradise, man. Everyone's coming there to gamble. Everyone's coming to Ephesus to, to engage in idolatry. So, I mean, it is a pretty big stand they were taking there. Um, now, the Chris's, uh, Chris's thing here. Uh, what does angel mean to the angel of the church in Ephesus? Uh, this, this is kind of rough here uh, because, I mean, there, I mean, there's possibilities, uh, realistically. Uh, but the word angel is the Greek word angelos. Uh, it's translated to mean both celestial beings 
uh, the angels as we kind of think of them, and men. Um, generally, the term messenger is used. Uh, in the Septuagint, the Septuagint was the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Uh, that's what Jesus used in the first century. Uh, the Septuagint would translate, um, would use the term angelos in translations referring to celestial beings and translations referring to prophets, uh, translations referring to priests and to heralds, those who would speak on behalf of the king or on behalf of one king to another king. Um, so generally the work of an angel, whether they're celestial or they're human, has been for the purpose of heralding a message. Um, this is seen uh, with several unnamed messengers in the Old Testament. Uh, they would come and bring news on behalf of the king or to a king. And this is also seen of uh, John the Baptizer. In the Septuagint, um, in Malachi 3, let's, look, let's just look there right quick. It, it might be better to look at it. Malachi chapter 3. You have prophecy concerning Christ, prophecy concerning John the Baptist. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. That's a reference to John the Baptist, right? The word messenger, we see the messenger in the English, in the, if, if, they had taken the Old Testament, like the Septuagint, and translated that term into Greek, and then we were to transliterate that, like angelos, angels, that's the transliteration, is where if you take the, the uh, phonetic and just make it into a word itself, the phonetic reading of it, and so if we were to do that with this, it would say, I behold, I send my angel, and he will prepare the way before me. Um, it's used there in the Septuagint referring to John the Baptist and it's also used in our New Testament concerning John the Baptist. You look here in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 10, you'll see the same thing in Mark 1 and verse 2 and Luke 7 and verse 27. But in Matthew 11 and verse 10, Jesus quotes from Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1. And if you look at the Greek here, it, it would say, Behold, I send my angelos angel before your face who will prepare your way before you and so uh, that's a that's an interesting uh, connection there it's used to John the Baptist so you have it being used in prophets think about how else angels were used in scripture you have them ministering to Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 11 after he had been tempted uh, in the wilderness you have them ministering to Peter Acts chapter uh, 12 and verses 7 through 11, Peter was in prison, right? I remember it says that the angel of the Lord came and appeared to Peter, and it, he told him, you know, put your cloak on, and then he, they started walking, the, the door opened up, and they walked by as if nobody had seen. Um, you have, uh, and this is, this is maybe where identification of what the angel is maybe gets a little sticky here, but if you look over here at Hebrews chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1, the Hebrew writer is making the point that Jesus is better. Chapter 1, Jesus is better than the angels. Verse 13, the angels are subject to him. Verse 14, and it's very interesting, are they, that would refer to the angels, not all ministering spirits Send out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit eternal salvation. And so that would be the Christian, right? So you have Hebrews 1 and verse 14 where um, the angels have been delegated uh, in some way to minister to the, uh, to the Christians. Uh, that definitely seems to fit the context of the first century, the miraculous age, you have the angel appearing to Philip and directing him to the Ethiopian eunuch, Acts chapter 8. You have uh, the angel appearing to Cornelius, Acts chapter 10. You have the angel appearing to Paul in Acts chapter 27 and verse 23 as he's about to be shipwrecked. Uh, you have the angels being used instrumentally 
in John's uh, revelation here. You have angels that were involved in taking the soul of Lazarus to the bosom of Abraham in Luke 16 and verse 19. Um, but again, all of that takes place in the miraculous age, and we know that the miraculous age has uh, since ceased. So kind of the question is, how do angels act today? Because Hebrews 1 and verse 14 kind of gives off the idea that angels are acting today. Um, and, and so you kind of have to ask the question of how they act today. Um, first, we kind of ask the broad question here, right? This is the question everybody wants to know. Do they act as the mass of people say that they act? And so that would be no. Uh, some Because the way that some people say that the angels act today is that the angels come and they bring a revelation to you. Paul would argue against this, and again, Acts 27, Paul had seen an angel face to face. Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, that if we are an angel from heaven, come to you with any other gospel, let him be accursed. So, no, that's not how angels act. Um, some would say that they come to protect God's people. The idea of a guardian angel in a very technical sense, that's true. Psalm 34 and verse 7 says that the angel Lord encamps around those who fear him. Uh, so there's truth to that, but not in the way that uh, it's often used. It's not true in the fact that it will deliver you from death. If that was the case, uh, brethren would not have died in, in situations of illness, situations of tragedy, like a car wreck or something like that. Uh, if that were true, they would... Um, deliver us from tragedy which we don't see that taking place uh, if that did take place uh, church shootings would not be a thing right the guardian angel would be guarding the door uh, like like uh, like we see in uh, in Genesis 3 with the Garden of Eden right uh, the church is God's place the church is God's uh, you, you see it the paradise of God's people and so wouldn't the angel be guarding the church the same way in the garden, garden of Eden? Maybe, I don't know. But that's what people would argue, right? That's how they say angels act today. Uh, they say the angels, uh, you, you have a guardian angel who would deliver you from sin or temptation. Uh, you see the story, a lot of people, the angel, uh, mystic appearance coming and tapping you on the shoulder. Oh, don't do this, blah, blah, blah. Uh, John would argue that. And again, you see in the book of Revelation, John has many dealings with angels. John would argue that. 1 John 1 and verse 8, if you say you do not sin, you're a liar. Uh, James would argue that. James 3 and verse 2, we all stumble in many different ways. What does that word stumble mean? We sin. We all sin in many different ways. We all have different things which tempt us. And so kind of returning back to the question, how do they act today? Uh, unsure. That's the best possible answer you can give. Unsure. Does the Bible speak to it? Yes. Uh, but what we know uh, to be true is that speculation about how they act today is 100% useless. And uh, just trusting the fact that they act according to God's will is the right way to address it. But going back to the original question right quick, um, Thinking about, again, the purpose of angels, how it can be translated, it can be translated messenger, it can be translated as a celestial being, all these different things. My best understanding, and, and I tried to check some other commentaries just to make sure I was in line with some other people on their thinking, and when I say commentaries, I'm talking about members of the church uh, who have preached for a good long while. Um, the best way maybe to understand this is that uh, while it could refer to celestial beings, it's definitely not out of the question, because again, miraculous age, uh, it most likely refers to a human messenger. And a human messenger would be um, the minister of the local congregation. It could be one of the elders of the congregation, uh, one who would teach and who would speak. And uh, I would lean, in this case, towards the idea of a minister of the congregation. Right, especially in the case of Ephesus, yeah. because Timothy was a local preacher there. Yes, right. 